Well, the last talk was all doom and gloom, where we saw how sidechain attacks are pretty powerful, how you can just by looking at the timing on the scalar multiplication totally see how many bits are zero. Well, we haven't seen yet how bad it is for attacks, but well, okay, these papers got the press and they were actually breaking some real life deployed cryptography. It is actually pretty bad if that happens. So this talk is about defenses. This talk is about how to do the same computations in constant time. And the first version I'm gonna show you is a bit wasteful. It will, well, look like, hey, we're doing kind of the worst case um, cost. We're doing one addition for each bit. Normally when you're doing double and add method for each bit you might add or you might not and so each bit is 50 50 0 1 and so you're on average only doing 50 percent additions in the double and always add method you're always adding all right um, on the other hand this seems necessary in order to hide the information from this branch so there is no more if branch the other thing which has changed and that's an important one to highlight, namely the loop length is fixed. And in order to get this, I'm defining my L to be some maximum value. Okay, that depends on what my system is like, but typically, well, if I'm on a loop to curve group, then I know what the order of my point is. And so I would use the bit length of this order of the point as a maximum. Nothing would ever have a larger length, and so I'm using that. And now, okay, well, if I want to run through the bits of A up to something like this max value, and well, okay, that's how I initialize my loop here, but my A might be shorter. So I have to, similar to how I did this in the windowing method, I have to pad with zeros at the top bits. So at the least significant bits, the coefficients of 2 to 0, I have my normal bit pattern of A. And then on the top part, up to length L, I fill up with zeros. So in Python, you have the command a.digits. Well, okay, you have a.bits for getting the bits. And if you're calling a.digits, that's a more general case, uh, general where you have to specify what the base is. Well, bits want base 2, so you call in digits with 2. And then it also says you're allowed to pad up to length L. So padding 2 or pad 2 means you're filling up with zeros. Now the other thing which can go wrong is, if you remember in the double and add method, we initialize this R, this result point, we initialize this as p and then we start the doubling for each step. But we would now be starting with something well where the scalar still has all these zeros. We're in the top parts where the scalar isn't even filled. And so we start with initializing r at zero. So I'm writing zero here as a shorthand because, well, it depends on what elliptic curve form we're on. So zero is what you get if you take zero times your base point p. So say on Edwards curve, that's a point 0, 1. On a Weierstrass curve, this would be the point infinity. Montgomery curve will also be infinity. So that's your initialization. And from then on, you have a very regular pattern. If you initialize at 0, well, you get to the step here, you're doubling. Well, 2 times 0 is still 0. So the doubling step doesn't do anything until we have actually encountered our first addition. Now in the double and always add method, well, we're adding at each step, so we're always adding p to our r. And now this is a kind of annoying computation because your r is just zero at the beginning, and so you're computing zero plus r, uh, zero plus p, which is p, and then you're typically forgetting it until you reach the first non-zero bit. All right, so once you do these computations, you're doubling, you're adding p, you're doubling, you're adding p, we actually now want to do the same that we had with the if before. But we're concerned about branches leaking. 
And so instead of doing if call there, what well, we have now invested the time to compute the addition. And what we're also going to do is we do a selection by arithmetic. So let's run through this um, computation here for R step by step in the two cases. So the bit of A could be 0 or the bit of A could be 1. If the bit of A is 0, we just want to double. If the bit of A is 1, we want to add P. Okay, so if the bit of A is 0, then we have 1 minus 0 is 1, so we're having 1 times R, so we'll be getting R, and then this bit we set is 0, so no contribution of Q. Alright, so if the bit is 0, we do recover just R, which was 2 times the old R, so that's good. If the bit is 1, then we have 1 minus 1, so 0 times R, so no contribution from R, plus 1 times Q. So we're actually selecting Q, which is the R plus P that we hope for. So yes, this selection does get us the correct value out of these two possibilities. Now per bit, and now L of those, not just the bits in A, we're doing one doubling and one addition. The trace will be uniform. It will be as costly as the worst case. So you will just see, well, trickles at the same corner. It won't look perfect because like when you're doing physical attacks, you will always have some clock jitter and such, but it is essentially a uniform trace. But of course, there are also ways you can mess this up. You could, for instance, mess up the computations which involve this neutral element. They could be faster, or it could be that multiplications by zero are faster. Now, it also depends a lot on how you rep represent things. So I said already the neutral element on Weierstrass was this point infinity. And for typical implementations, infinity is not a valid input. So we can't actually do this one easily on a Weierstrass grid. So initialization at infinity would require a valid format to put this in and have this valid format be fine with doubling and this addition. For Edwards curve, well, we have proven that this is a complete addition law. So initializing at 0, 1 on the Edwards curve here is perfectly valid. So Edwards curves or twisted Edwards curves are again the easy and nice case where this double and always add method works as described here. So now we can also think about how you would do the same thing for your um, Windowing method, and as I said, it then gets a bit more complicated. Of course, you could compute all the additions here, but that would be really, really, really expensive. So, you do want to do something with masking. You want to hide which of the points you're grabbing, and then compute one addition with this point. And you have to do it in such a way that if the coefficient is zero, so you're adding zero times p, it costs the same. Now, again, on Edwards curves, 0 times p is the point zero 0,1, so that's typically, I mean, it's any implementation that I know of would have a valid way of doing this, assuming that the lower level of the field operations doesn't give away that you're adding 0 or you're multiplying by 0 or 1. Of course, if you as a human multiply by 0 or 1, it's a lot faster, but you should implement your computer not to notice that. A different way to protect your sideshow information is called the Montgomery ladder. And it's sort of similar to how the double and always add method works, at least in efficiency. But it has a nice feature that all intermediate values are used. There is no dummy operations. Dummy operations are sometimes making people a little concerned if they're not just looking at uh, passive attacks like timing attacks, but also looking at active attacks where some attacker could kind of Insult, insert a fault, so poke your computer while it's doing computation, and just the same as you're sitting somewhere doing your computation and somebody comes and interrupts you, your computer could get a little irritated when you interrupt it. Okay, for the computer, you need to poke it with needles or shoot some electromagnetic radiation at it or something similar, so it needs a, a serious amount of distraction, but you can distract your computer, you can just glitch it. So 
if you do that, then if your foot, foot for instance, do this um, in Q, and then Q is not used because, well, this one selected R, the attacker might notice that the result is the same even though they had glitched the computation. And so they can figure out what the bit was, or they put a, a glitch in this computation, and then, oh sorry, it, in this computation, it, it will always recognize, but if the glitch is in this computation, they can figure out whether the bit was used or not. So the uh, Montgomery ladder is nicer in that all operations are used, all the mean details are used, um, but it's also a little bit more complicated to understand. So we're going to go through this slowly and carefully. There are several things which are the same as before. Well, okay, the first three lines are the same. We again go for some maximum length. We again head our scalar, the binary representation, to this length L by filling up the zeros. And then we now having two values which you're going to initialize. Um, our result is going to be in P0. That's what we're going to output here. And that one we initialize at zero, like on the previous slide, but we're also having another point P1, which we initialize at P. And for the inputs, we're having that the difference between P1 and P0 is P. And on the next slide, I will prove that we're keeping this difference. So it's actually an interesting operation that we're having an addition of points which have fixed difference. Now, if I would be allowed to write if here, then the operation would be if the bit is zero, we double the smaller point, the P0, and we add into the P1. If the bit is one, we double the upper point, the higher point, and we add the two points into the lower one. And I have to be careful about my order not to overwrite the point that I'm computing. So I will always compute the addition first, overriding the point which I'm not going to use, and then I'm going to compute the doubling. But I said, well, okay, um, if the bit is set, I want to double the P1 point and add into the P0 point. If the bit is not set, I want to double the P0 point and add into the P11. So here is where I'm going to update the contents of my points by doing what is called a conditional swap. And I don't just want a conditional swap, I want to swap in constant time. Okay, so <laughs> no ifs here. I mean, I want to have that if the bit is zero, the swap doesn't do anything. And if the bit is one, I do swap P0 and P1. And at the end of the computation, I mean, at this step here, I'm gonna swap back. I'll get to the C swap up there in a moment. Um, let me first go through uh, the comment down here. Well, if I'm swapping at the beginning of this operation and at the end, and I have a loop, well, then at the next step, I'm going to swap based on C, uh, on A, I minus 1. And so I can just merge those two swaps, namely, well, if both are 0, then nothing will happen. If one of them is 1 and one of them is 0, then I should swap exactly once. If it's both ones, then I should swap both. So I can come up with an operation on these coefficients a of i and a of minus i that merges the swaps. So that if in the long run I would have one swap at the beginning, then I would have one swap for each two bits at the end before I get to the next loop, and then at the very end I would have another swap, just depending on one bit. The no way, normal way to do this is actually to pad this to one more bit, so that then I can just run through the previous one in the next. Okay, how do I do the swap in constant time? Well, if the bit is zero, then this computation bit times r minus s will just return zero and zero as a curve point. If the bit is one, this will return r minus s as a curve point. This is not the cheapest way of computing it. I'll, uh, in the next slide, set link to an RC, which does something with bit manipulations, so x, or, and n. 
um, which is a lot cheaper, but it is harder to understand mathematically. So this is the way you can write it in math. And if you're actually going to implement it, check out that RFC. So the bit is just 0, 1. This is a curve point. And so the result, the dummy point, the dummy value there is a curve point. And then we're going to deterministically subtract dummy from R and add dummy to S. And we're now again going to run through the two cases. So if the point is the initial element, well, then dummy doesn't change anything. So R remains R, S remains S. But if the bit was 1, that's when we want to swap, then dummy is R minus S. So R minus R minus S is S. And S plus S minus R becomes R. So yes, this does conditionally swap. And these computations do not depend on the bit pattern. They will take invariant time, no matter whether the bit is 0 or 1. All right, now what does it actually do? So if the bit is 0, then we want to just double. We don't want to add, at least in our P0. And yeah, in that case, we double into P0. Now, if the bit is 1, then we normally say, OK, you want to double. And we also want to add the base point to it. Now, if you trust me for a moment that P1 remains a distance 1 from P0, so what we have as the starting distance, then computing P0 plus P1 is actually P0 plus P0 plus P, which is the same as 2 times P0 plus P. So if I'm correct that this addition will always remain at fixed distance, then the, well, this is the bit 1 case, and so this will be swapped back into P0, is actually getting 2 times P0 plus P. And in that case, the doubling, well, is sort of used, but only in the next step. OK, so now focusing on this inner loop here, while I'm still keeping the initialization, looking at this inner loop and doing the C-swap, I want to show you that, yes, the difference remains to be P. So if the bit was 0, then the C-swap doesn't change anything. So P0 is still P0, P1 is still P1. And then the new values, well, we um, added the two points into P1, that is here, and we doubled P0 into there. So if the inputs were such that P1 is larger by P than P0, then this difference remains. Because, I mean, here I'm having P1 minus P0. So I'm having the old P0 plus P1 minus 2P0 gives me exactly P1 minus P0 from the old values, which, well, at the start of this whole thing was P. Now the case of the bit is 1. So we have swapped. And now the new values are, if I write in the old values after swapping back, is that I have doubled the P1 value and I've added both values into P0. So if I now take the difference of those, I'm taking P1 minus P0, then I'm again left with, well, one of the P1s cancels, I'm left with P1, the old one, minus the old P0, which again is P. So in both cases, the difference after each step, while well, swapping forward, swapping backwards, um, is P. And so, uh, First of all, this shows that the Montgomery letter does, in fact, compute the right point. But it also um, shows that we're getting um, what is called a differential addition. And I realize I didn't update this. It's actually part 9, because what we're currently looking at is part 8. So in part 9, I'm going to show you differential addition on Montgomery curves, which is actually faster than general addition on Montgomery curves. So differential addition is addition of points where the difference is known. And well, in this Montgomery letter, we have a known and also fixed difference. So the difference P1 minus P0 is always the same point P, so it's known and it's fixed. And 
that makes the Montgomery letter, the Montgomery curves, one of the typical ways we do implement elliptic curve cryptography.